This afternoon we'll uh, start with presenting the numbers and then we'll go through uh, some of the updated of the modeling and the epidemiology of COVID-19 here in BC. So today we have 13 new cases who have tested positive for COVID-19 in BC, bringing our total to 2,835 people who have been uh, positive for, for COVID-19. Uh, that includes 960 people in the Vancouver Coastal Health Region, 1,480 people in the Fraser Health Region, 131 people in Vancouver Island Health Region, 199 people in the Interior Health Region, and 65 people in the Northern Health Region. We have no new health care or community outbreaks today. Uh, we have seven active outbreaks in our health care system, six in long-term care and one in acute care. And we've had an uh, increase of three residents affected to bring that total to uh, 372 residents of uh, long-term care or acute care and 227 staff. Um, in terms of our active cases, we have 174 active cases, of whom 16 people are in hospital in BC, seven of whom are in critical care or ICU. We have one new death today, um, also a person from long-term care, bringing our total number of people who have died from COVID-19 to 170. And our condolences go out to the family of this person, to his care team and his entire community. Um, we have uh, 2,491 people who have now fully recovered from COVID-19. So I'm going to move into our, uh, our modeling um, as we're talking about it. This is our going forward. Um, again, we've been transitioning, as people know, in our restart program uh, to uh, uh, phase two and um, as we move forward over the next couple of weeks we'll be moving into the next phase. So to start off with I want to update us on the epidemiology so how and where um, people have been affected in British Columbia and uh, we'll start with our epidemic curve so we've seen this before and this is now updated um, to include up until uh, June 21st so uh, 2,822 cases. And as you can see, we managed to flatten our curve very effectively in BC, although we continue to have cases. And we know that we continue to have cases as we moved into our restart and we started to have more activity in our communities. So what we have in this is not just those people who've been diagnosed through a laboratory test, but also from the beginning of May when we started our restart, we've had a number of people who have uh, had this disease but have not had a test for a variety of reasons. And we call those people epidemiologically linked cases. And we've had a number of those as well that you can see in purple on this graph. Um, also uh, today I wanted to report uh, our epidemic curve, so this is very similar to what you just saw, but reported by the likely source of the infection. And there's a couple of really important things to note in this. Um, one is the purple at the bottom. So those are the cases that are occurring in our community that are not linked, that we weren't able to connect to a cluster or an outbreak or know where their, their source of transmission came from. And you can see during the March period of time where we had our large number of cases, there was quite a lot of transmission in our community. And that's what these cases reflect. As we've moved into May and June, those cases have gone down quite dramatically. And I've said many times that's one of the indicators that we're watching to see how we're doing. And we still have a small number of cases that arise that we aren't able to determine where their infection came from. But those are very small numbers. More importantly, we are able to link the vast majority of cases that we have, and particularly in recent days, recent weeks, almost all of our cases have been linked. And we still continue ha to have imported cases. So the pink, uh, the orangey pink, are cases that are associated with international travel. Um, we had quite a lot of those early on. And more recently, we continue to have cases primarily in Canadians and people from BC who are returning from other countries around the world, including most recently India. As well, we know we've had uh, a number of cases in uh, temporary foreign workers who've been in uh, to work in our agricultural industry. 
um, as we had an outbreak early on in, in April, since that time the province has been providing accommodations for all of our temporary foreign workers who have come into BC for the 14-day quarantine period. And as of today, we have had uh, 27 people who have developed in um, COVID-19 while in their quarantine period or um, soon after arriving primarily um, in temporary foreign workers from Mexico. So we do believe that having the quarantine services that we've provided for people means that we can support them if they get sick and make sure they have what they need to effectively isolate before they go into the farms and, and provide that necessary essential work in the farms here in BC. Uh, the next slide uh, talks about the geographic distribution. So this is an update of what we presented last time, um, uh, which is cases by the health service delivery area, so smaller geographical areas. So the cumulative total is uh, everything, all the cases that we've had since uh, the beginning of the year. And then on the right we have the number of cases in the last 14 days. And as you can see from that, from the numbers that we've been presenting every day, the vast majority of our cases in the last couple of weeks have been in the Fraser Health region, particularly the Fraser East region, as well as Vancouver. Um, but we have had a smattering of cases both in the interior, uh, the north, and most recently on Vancouver Island. Uh, the next series of graphs, again, are an updated of, of uh, uh, case rates that we have presented before. And we can see that BC continues to have very low rates of confirmed cases per million population. So that's a rate so we can compare with other uh, jurisdictions, um, so compared to the rest of Canada, but also to a number of other countries. Um, what's concerning, of course, in this uh, schematic is um, the, the increase that we continue to see in a number of countries, particularly the U.S., which uh, we know is, um, directly affects us, but also a number of other countries like Brazil where cases are rapidly increasing. On the right-hand side, it, it compares us to other provinces in Canada, and we can see that we remain low, like a number of other provinces, and um, reassuringly on this, we can see that both Quebec and Ontario have leveled off as well, which is good news for all of us. Uh, the next slide presents uh, the similar information, an update on our death rate comparison um, compared to other countries, and we can see that um, BC uh, remains quite low, which is good news for us, and compared to uh, other provinces in Canada where we also uh, remain quite low. Uh, one of the things that uh, I wanted to talk about today uh, was uh, some of the new things that we're doing in our community. And one of these is a, is a fascinating project that's being uh, worked on at the, the Public Health Lab at the BC Centre for Disease Control, where we have some expertise in, in assessing water samples for uh, communicable diseases. And uh, they are working um, to develop a way to be able to monitor wastewater across the province as an indicator of when the virus may be in our communities. And this is something that we've seen in a number of other countries around the world. Uh, the Netherlands had started a program, Finland and Germany, and recently Italy has reported out on uh, the, some of the sampling that they did retrospectively, which showed that they were able to find COVID uh, RNA, so the genetic material from the virus, in uh, wastewater samples from December and January uh, of this year. Um, indicating that there must uh, there was likely circulation in some parts of of northern Italy prior to it being recognized in the community, so this is a project that we are working with uh, other groups across the country. Um, but right now, in developing the methodology, there's been testing of wastewater in the Vancouver uh, facility, which covers some parts of of Surrey as well. Um, and for the last five weeks, uh, there has been testing done, and we have had no positives which reflects the low level of transmission that we are seeing in communities right now. Um, so this is something that we're planning on rolling out and using in the coming months, particularly in smaller communities as a way of helping us understand if there's been transmission in that community. And this is building on work that's been done around the world to help monitor for polio, which is also a, a viral infection that's shed in, in stool and into wastewater. So more to come on that as, as, these, uh, um, as these projects roll out. 
Finally, I want to talk about uh, some of our modeling and analysis and the things that we've been doing and where we are in terms of, of uh, the impact of the restart program here in BC. So this is again an update of some of the mobility patterns that we've been following over time in British Columbia. And we can see that we are gradually returning slowly and carefully uh, to more activities in our community. Um, there we're spending less time always at home and more time in places like workspaces, retail, recreation spaces. spaces. Um, and that's uh, what we expect as we've moved into this new stage. Um, so the mobility metrics are generally increasing, but they are re remain lower than the seasonal norms based on data from uh, previous years. This is an update as well of the dynamic compartmental modeling that uh, we have been doing. And as you can see, we've moved along along the trajectory of this. And it uses things like the mobility data, like some of the network analysis that we have uh, in the province to help us get an understanding of what could happen if we uh, continue along the trajectory that we are. So right now, the model suggests that we are uh, had a slight increase in new cases, which we have seen, and that our contact rates, so the rates of, of activity, mobility, and contacts have gone up to somewhere around 65% of normal. So you will recall when we first presented this information, when we put in the public health measures that um, had people mostly staying at home, staying apart, not going into uh, most retail workplaces, we were down around 30% of our usual contacts. As we've started uh, the restart, we moved up to somewhere around 40% and we're now somewhere around 60, 65%. And I'm intentionally saying that is not a, an exact. And one of the reasons why it is not exact other than it's a model, is the fact that we have um, very small numbers of cases. And when you have small numbers, uh, you can get a wide variation in, uh, in the prediction models. So they're what we call unstable numbers. And what we can see that from the, the wideness of the pink bars that surround the line that we see there. So small numbers give us a sense of where we are, but uh, can um, but are difficult to, to pinpoint. So we are somewhere around 60, 65% of normal, but it could be a little bit more and it could be a little bit less. What this helps us understand is that we are in a place where we are having more contact in our communities, and we all know that. We can see that. We're out going to work, we're going shopping, we're doing things that we did before. But what this also tells us with the small numbers and the fact that we're not seeing increases, dramatic increases in hospitalizations or people in ICU, is that many of those contacts are done in a safe way. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. This is uh, the scenarios that could come out of where we are. And as we see, um, you know, somewhere around 60, we're somewhere in that 50, 60, 70 percent range. If we go dramatically increased, so into 80% or back to what used to be normal, we can expect to see that we will have more cases and we run the potential risk of having dramatically increased or rapid rebound in new cases. So that is what we want to avoid. We need to stay where we are, where we're having safe contacts and we're not seeing dramatic increases in number of cases. This is an, a new um, projection that is based on what we call the reproductive number. So the reproductive number is uh, the, a reflection of how many people a case will transmit to when they become ill. And early on, that reproductive number was quite high because we weren't recognizing uh, new cases and they were transmitting. They had lots of people they were in contact with. And we know from data I presented before that on average, um, a, a case had 11 people that they were in contact with, but some of them, it was many, many more than that. So this gives us a sense of what we've done. And what we have done in British Columbia, by taking the measures that we've done together, we've flattened that and we've brought that down below one. So that means that not everybody transmits and imagine most people don't transmit to anybody after they develop symptoms themselves. And we were quite flat but well below one, uh, well into May. 
once we did start to increase our contacts, to have increase our bubbles, to have more contact with other people, that rose. But we've been hovering around one, which is where we need to stay, preferably slightly below one, which allows us to increase our, our activity, make sure we get our, our social connections, our economic connections going without um, having rapid increase in numbers of people who are exposed and infected. So that's our threshold, as we call it. So, the, so these models um, are calibrated using our BC data, and it really helps us understand that they're illustrative. They're not predictive of what's going to happen. They tell us a lot about where we are right now and give us a sense of what we need to do going forward. It's important to remember when we look at these models that they are um, that, that multiple actions were put in place, and they cannot um, detect all of those actions. So if we have more contact in retail spaces, for example, and we're going out to more places or we're going to restaurants, it is reflected in the increased activity that we see in the models. But it, what's not reflected is that we're doing it in a safe way. That means we have barriers, for example, the plexiglass between me and the cashier at the grocery store, or the, um, the, the space around the table that I'm sitting at on the patio. Those are things that are safe contacts. And what we can see from our models is, even though we're having more contacts, we're doing it in a way that is preventing transmission of infections. The other key thing about that, of course, is that we to maintain control of our epidemic here in BC, we need to continue to do these foundational pieces. We need to continue to have small uh, numbers of contacts, to have small groups in big spaces, to maintain our safe distances, to make sure that if we're feeling unwell, that we stay away from others, stay away from work, stay away from um, going out. And that uh, the other piece, of course, that helps us in all of this is the contact tracing that we do in public health to make sure that we can connect it with anybody who may be at risk because they've been exposed. And as we know, there's nothing we can do right now to prevent you from getting sick if you've had close contact with somebody with the virus. What we can do is support you to stay away from others so that you're not passing it on, particularly to those that you're closest to. And how we do that is through the public health work of uh, contact tracing and contact management. So these contact tracing models are ones that we've been looking at with BC data over the last uh, number of weeks. And what it tells us is that as we've relaxed our distancing, as we've had more contacts in our community, we need to make sure that public health has the resources and that we're able to both quickly and completely find people who may be at risk. When we have moderate distancing measures in place, uh, which I would say we are at right now, we need to find about 75% of people within one to three days to be able to effectively control the epidemic. As we're moving into our next phase, where we know we're going to have more activity, where we know um, that we're going to be moving more, we need to continue to be able to effectively find people. And our, our dilemma is that we have to find that balance because we need to find um, more complete contact tracing within a shorter frame of time. So we need to find everybody within a few days. And we are good at that. We've shown the data from BC where we have um, effectively found 97 to 99 percent of contacts within 48 hours after a case is identified. So these are the scenarios that we're working towards now, making sure that we all do our part, which means making sure that, uh, that we are keeping our bubbles small, but also that we know the people that we're with. These are why some of the measures that we have in place to make sure that we have a contact information for people, that if I'm going to a, a church meeting, that I have a, a ability to identify who's been at that meeting so that if somebody does inadvertently come in with symptoms and we find them in public health, we're able to connect with people quickly and prevent transmission. So this is our, our conclusions. As we've relaxed distancing measures, the strong contact tracing in BC has provided a buffer against renewed growth of cases. As we further relax, 
the completeness and the rapidity of this contact tracing will be even more important. And in combination with things like we have been doing and with staying home if we're sick, those are the things that are going to get us through the next few months. And that is what is going to help us manage this pandemic as we open up both our, our societal connections, our business connections and our family connections. So these models show we are increasing our contacts, and we know that, but we're doing it in a safe way. And to continue to safely increase our contacts, we meet need to maintain the measures we have in place and ensure we're well-supported public health teams efficiently and thoroughly undertake contact tracing around the province, and then we can make it through these next few months and into the fall. So this modeling shows us that in BC, the measures we have in place to protect ourselves, each other, our communities, combined with our slow, gradual transition in through phase two and into phase three is working. We have eased our restrictions in a way that has allowed us to increase our social and economic interactions while keeping our new cases low. 65% is where we need to be. So we need to expand into phase three with maintaining what we have now. We have, until we have an effective treatment or a vaccine, these rules for safe social interactions must continue to be maintained as part of our everyday life. We know that if we go too far and let that number get too high, we risk a resurgence, and we have seen that happen in other parts of the world. We all know what we must do. The foundations of our safety are clear. Always stay home if you're ill. Always follow good hand hygiene. Always maintain a safe distance when you can and use barriers to protect us when we need to be in within that safe distance. A non-medical mask is also part of what we can do when we can't always consistently maintain a safe distance. As individuals, we also have an important role to play in contact tracing. It is in public health a team effort or a team sport that all of us need to be committed to to be successful. Our responsibility is to keep our bubbles small. Know the people that we are with, that we have those, con those um, close contacts over time with. This, give this gives public health teams the ability to notify everybody who may be at risk and contain the spread as quickly as possible. So this approach applies to all of us, no matter where we may be, whether it's at home, at work, in our community, or traveling to other parts of British Columbia or Canada. We know that closed spaces, large crowds, contact, close contact with people over time are the things that are riskier, and we need to do those with caution. So be respectful and understanding of others. That has what has got us this far in British Columbia. And we need to continue together to do our part to protect our province, our community, our elders, and our families. Let's continue to find that balance and to maintain that balance as a community as we chart our path forward. And let's all do it, of course, by being kind with each other, being calm, and being safe.